here, some as attendees and some on YouTube. Uh, all are welcome. Um, we keep it you know, mostly to faculty, uh, not exclusively on this side, uh, so that heckling is done exclusively by us, but other people join in from chat every now and then. And if somebody writes in something on YouTube, I see that and convey it to you. Sorry, I'm just trying to fix my audio. I'm very sorry. Okay, so... So okay. anyhow, the point here is it's a seminar like any other seminar. Uh, and I am sure you have given online seminars before. So <laughs> um, 90 minutes, we heckle. Um, the floor is yours. It's great to have you here. Let's go ahead. No, we don't hear you. We still don't hear you. It isn't only me, right? We don't hear you. No, no. So we, we don't, I think you probably should pick, put on a headset. It might fix the problem, it usually does. We lost the speaker. <laughs> Interesting. So we had a moment where I lost the internet connection briefly as well. Yeah, something is jinxed with this uh, visit of or online visit of, of Francesco, right? Um, you know, my my uh, headset refused to start. Your internet in, and now his computer is acting up. The thing is, I mean, nowadays everyone has so many things plugged into the computer, especially this is right. since pandemic, and it's creating all kinds of um, short circuiting every now and then. I mean, We hadn't even began asking the hard questions. Interesting. Well, I, I think it's coming back. It's just most probably his computer approach. That's my guess. Things happen. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. So, yes, yeah, sorry about this. I, I had to restart everything. Uh, but, so it I, happens I to all of us. Yeah. Uh, as I was saying, uh, although online is a seminar like any other seminar, so you go ahead and present and we will heckle you. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Okay, sorry that I had to restart everything, so I need to uh, get the slides back on. One second. Huh? Uh, meanwhile, uh, let, let me give the, uh, the uh, idea um, that uh, we wanted to have Francesco here for a long time anyway, but this is fortuitous timing in that uh, this week we have Francesco, next week we're going to have Eric Lieper, and they're going to talk about the same topic. Um, and and um, so that's almost like a mini course uh, <laughs> by, by, by the great ones. So um, the floor is yours. And... Okay, thanks a lot. And you can see the slides, no? Yes. Okay, at least that worked. Okay. Uh, so first of all, thanks a lot uh, for, for the invitation. Yes, I would love to be in person, but unfortunately, this is the uh, life we live in these days. 
So this is a, a joint work with Renato Faccini and Leonardo Melosi. They are both the central banks, so the usual disclaimer uh, applies. So as you are probably aware of, one of the uh, most important Sorry, legacy... I, I have a quick thing. So I see a black something um, on the side of your slides. Is that only me? You see it, okay. Um, I think that you have a pop-up that you are not sharing, and that can happen. It's do, what, what do I, okay, let me share the whole screen. Let's try this other way, okay? I'm going to share the whole screen. Okay. Uh, okay, let's try this way. Uh, hopefully that's going to work better. Uh, what about now? Do you see things properly? I still see um, shaded areas. Uh, I guess that's what I should call it. Uh, Sang, is that only me? Do you see that too? No, no, I see it too. If you're, if you're, uh, so and they keep in, changing, right? Yeah, yes. and the location of them yeah. is changing. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I, I have your faces here. So let me maybe. Ah, that looks like that. Yeah. Yes, so, so, yeah. Very I see, good. I see. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, is, is it okay now? Yeah, this Very is, good. Yeah, Go ahead. It's working yes. well now. Yeah. Okay, Thank good. You. So now, now I really feel like I'm talking to myself because I don't see your faces anymore. Uh, again, Francesco, do this. Um, unshare this. You are sharing the screen. And I think earlier you were sharing the screen too. And just share the presentation. Okay. Let me, uh, I thought I was sharing the presentation before, but let me, let me try. So now I'm sharing just the PDF. And uh, so suppose I put your faces down. Do you see? Do you see? Do you see shaded areas again? Yes. Yeah, two yeah. of us. Yeah. So when I put your faces down, I see the shaded areas. So uh, you guys see the shaded areas. Yeah. Uh, now you don't see them anymore. That's right. Okay. So I, 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 for some reason, today everything is going south. Uh, uh, the <laughs> airport. The airports well, have, have always worked today. They decided not to work. Uh, the Zoom decided to start acting funny today. It's possible that uh, it is because I just installed Windows 11 and uh, I, uh, for the AirPods, I read that there are a lot of people having similar issues. So I think maybe this is also related to having installed Windows 11, okay. but you will find out if uh, Eric next week is going to also have Windows 11. Very um, good. So this is a cautionary tale for us. Uh, meanwhile, when we talk, we're going to say our names first so that you will know who is talking. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and so... As you probably have noticed, uh, one of the most important legacies of, of the pandemic is the large public debt uh, that has been accumulated by several countries. So this has created uh, in, uh, in the US a quite lively debate about uh, the risk uh, of uh, the loss of price stability and the return to high economic uh, volatility. So uh, Larry Summers have writ has written about this, Blanchard has written about this. Uh, at the same time, uh, there, there's been a, a quite a concern on the opposite side that if we were to uh, increase now interest rates or, or we were to implement a fiscal stabilization uh, right now, this would jeopardize uh, the recovery from uh, the pandemic. So, so essentially, you have these two opposite views about what is uh, what we should be doing. On one side, uh, people are concerned about the high inflation. On the other side, people are concerned about fiscal stability. So what we are going to argue in this paper is that this, uh, trade, this apparent trade-off uh, amidst a, a, a more pleasant outcome. So in particular, what we are going to argue is that the most likely our outcome is uh, a monetary and fiscal coordination going uh, forward to let inflation moderately uh, overshoot with respect to the long-term inflation target. And this will have the benefit to, uh, to stabilize a fraction of the government debt that is uh, fiscally unfunded and also at the same time to, to eliminate a deflationary bias uh, that has been characterized the US economy for the past uh, 20 years. So the main point we are going to make uh, is that this solution, this uh, third outcome of cooperation between the two authorities is in fact very much in line with historical experience for, for the US. But at the same time, given the very large amount of debt that we have these days uh, requires a clear policy communication. So let me be specific about what we do in this paper, how we are going to make this point. So we're going to build a, a tank model with partially unfunded government debt. So in this model, business cycle and monetary policy shocks propagate in the way we are used to think about. So think about the typical New Keynesian uh, uh, propagation mechanism 
With respect to these shocks, uh, uh, the, the model behaves uh, in the way we are used to. However, we are also going to allow for unfunded fiscal shocks. So these are essentially uh, increase, uh, increases in spending that are not backed by future uh, uh, taxation and are going to lead to what we call a fiscal theory of trend inflation because they are accommodated by uh, the central bank. What we are going to show, we bring this model to the data using uh, Bayesian techniques. And what we're going to show is that fiscal trend inflation accounts for the bulk of the inflation dynamics uh, in the US economy. In particular, we're going to argue that the great inflation of the, of the 1970s can be thought as a result of uh, uh, large fiscal shocks that occurred in, in the mid 60s. Uh, in particular, we're going to link this to the Great Society initiatives. Uh, the, uh, we are going to argue that in the aftermath of the Volcker disinflation, uh, we are going to have that partially unfunded debt has, going to, uh, has been uh, essentially counteracting some deflationary bias that was coming from other sources like globalization or changing demographics. And, uh, and then what we were going to point out is that historically, this, this share of unfunded debt and the resulting fiscal trend inflation have been evolving very slowly, very sluggishly. So, uh, so this is a caveat because uh, in recent uh, uh, years, we had a, a very rapid acceleration in government spending. And so if there were uh, some miscommunication on the side of policymakers, there is a risk of, uh, of a run up uh, in inflation. On the other hand, when we focus on the current situation, we are going to argue that there is really at the moment no evidence that the US is heading toward uh, uh, a, a prolonged period of high inflation. Uh, in fact, we find results that I would say are very much in line with the, the current uh, Fed narrative that we're going to have a temporary increase uh, of inflation above the inflation target, and that then inflation will uh, naturally revert to the target uh, slowly uh, over time. Is this under rational expectations? This is under rational expectations. And uh, essentially, uh, the, uh, the, the way the model works uh, is that we are going to uh, identify what is the fraction of spending that agents uh, think that it's not backed by future taxation. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me, uh, let me start. Uh, so I, I, we recently revised the, the structure of the paper and also the, the structure of the talk. So this is the, the, essentially the second time I present the paper in this form. And, and so what we did, uh, given that we have a, a fairly large and rich model that we bring to the data, we wanted to start with the simplest model we could think of to explain how this idea of uh, uh, fiscal trend inflation works, okay? So let me... Uh, present to you the, the, the uh, simplest model we could think of is essentially like a representative household that maximizes expected utility in an endowment economy. So you see here the typical uh, optimization problem, and you can see that the household has a fixed endowment uh, Y in every period. And then the households can save in uh, uh, bonds that are here are just one period bonds and is subject to some taxation, uh, uh, net taxation tau t. The government budget constraint uh, is, uh, again, very simple. You, you have QT is the price uh, of, uh, of the bonds, and then you have uh, tax revenues tau t. We are going to have a simple monetary rule, so the, the typical uh, Taylor rule. And, uh, and uh, unlike, uh, I would say, most models that we see these days, we are also going to explicitly uh, model the behavior of the fiscal authority introducing a fiscal rule. So you see here that taxes, net taxes in deviations from the steady state react to debt in deviations from the steady state according to a coefficient gamma. So here you can see that the fiscal rule is essentially isomorphic to uh, uh, the monetary rule as the same uh, structure. It's just that the target here is uh, uh, the debt as opposed to uh, the inflation level. And the, the second thing you, you might notice is that the only shock that we are going to have in this economy is a shock to primary surpluses. We don't have anything else apart from this, uh, uh, this shock. And finally, they, we have the market clearing condition that in every period, consumption has to be equal to the endowment. Now, if you-, if you... No, no, Before you go ahead. Um, sure. So there are taxes, but there is no government spending. So- Yes, yes, that's, that's key, that's key. So these are net taxes and they're lump sum. And, uh, and so you can think about it when they are negative, 
the household is receiving some uh, uh, resources. When uh, they are positive, the household is, is paying some resources to the government. So it is but key. Been, but, but I guess what I'm mildly lost about is why is market clearing consumption equals output or income then? Right. So what, you know, some, somewhere I want to see the government because the taxes have to be factored in somewhere here, no? No, no, because this is not spending. So there is no G essentially. Okay, so the market clearing would say that the, gov- the goods consumed by the government and the goods consumed by uh, 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 households had to be equal to the total endowment. No? So if we had G, that's where it would show up. Uh, if, uh, if you only have uh, transfers, what would be the typical uh, uh, solution to this model? I tax you more today, you borrow against the future, so you buy the government bonds and then you repay in the future. Okay, so Ricardo equivalence essentially applies, and you will see that that's exactly what happens under a certain policy mix. Okay, so the market clearing condition only involves uh, the uh, consumption of goods. So here there is no public consumption of goods, there is only the government is uh, simply taxing or, uh, uh, or transferring money to uh, households. Okay. So you will see that you might say, why does it matter? Well, if we assume uh, the typical policy mix, it wouldn't matter because Ricardian equivalence applies. Okay, so we're going to see that in a moment. But in terms of market current clearing condition, uh, they, there is no consumption of the government. Okay. 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 So uh, the, if you linearize uh, this model around the deterministic steady state you get something that is uh, fairly familiar. So the first equation over here, consider these are all in deviations from steady state. Uh, it basically says that the nominal interest rate uh, is a function of expected inflation, okay? So uh, in deviations from the steady state here, the real interest rate is constant. So in deviations from the steady state, the nominal interest rate depends on expected inflation. So this is, uh, again, the typical Fisherian uh, model. On top of that, we are, we are going to have the linearized uh, uh, government budget constraint that says that debt today depends on debt in the previous period, primary surpluses, and then the uh, uh, realized uh, real interest rate, this term over here. Okay. Then we are going to have the, the uh, linearized Taylor rule, the nominal interest rate uh, response to inflation, and we're going to have the realized fiscal rule in which taxes net taxes react to uh, debt in deviations from its own steady state. And then remember, we only have one shock, that is the fiscal shock. So if you combine these two equations, by the way, this, this model is very similar. It's not identical, but it's very similar in spirit to the model that uh, Leeper in, used in 91 to introduce uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, uh, um, active money, passive fiscal versus passive money, active fiscal. Okay, so we are going to build uh, on, on that paper to make the point of, of, of uh, what we mean with uh, uh, unfunded uh, fiscal uh, debt, okay? Um, okay, so if you combine, and, and please feel free to interrupt me if, uh, if uh, you have questions because I, I really cannot see you. So if I, even if you have a puzzle face, I wouldn't be able to tell. Okay, so if, right. if, you, if you combine these two equations, you get, uh, two blocks, you get the monetary block in which expected inflation depends on uh, inflation with a coefficient phi. And then you get what we call the fiscal block in which debt today depends on debt in the previous period according to a coefficient one over beta minus gamma. It depends on uh, uh, the realized real interest rate that now is essentially a function of current inflation because the central bank reacts to inflation and then uh, the, the fiscal shock, okay? So you basically get uh, two equations in two variables, debt and inflation. You have only one non-predetermined variable. So the, you, you have the typical uh, blanchard kahn conditions would say that you need uh, one root uh, outside the unit circle. So this brings us uh, to what I, I, I just anticipated, the partition of the parameter space uh, that has been introduced by Eric Lieper. So Lieper uses a slightly different model, but the spirit is very much the same. So what Lieper shows, uh, is that there are two areas of the parameter space that lead to a unique solution. Uh, we call the first one the monetary-led policy mix. In this situation, the fiscal authority is uh, committed to do its job, that would be to stabilize debt uh, through fiscal adjustments. So in terms of parameter restrictions, what that means is that the coefficient gamma is larger than one over beta minus one. 
Let's see why that's important. Well, if, uh, if gamma is larger than one over beta minus one, this whole coefficient here is less than one. So what gives you that stability is the fiscal adjustment. So that is on a stable path. So it's basically on a mean reverting path, thanks to the coefficient gamma that is controlled by the fiscal authority. In, in this situation, the, the monetary authority is uh, active then, so it has full control of inflation, meaning that the Taylor principle is satisfied and the central bank reacts more than one-to-one -to, -one to uh, inflation. So what we are going to see in a moment is that in this monetary-led policy mix, the macroeconomy is isolated from the fiscal block. So, and that's where, going back to Refet's question, why don't you have G? Well, because this makes this position of the model very simple. If I don't have G, even if the government tax people more or less, Ricardian equivalence applies and nothing happens in my macroeconomy. However, there is another area of the parameter space that we call the fiscally led policy mix, in which the fiscal authority is not committed to implementing the necessary fiscal adjustment to keep debt on a stable path. So this means that the coefficient gamma is not large enough to guarantee mean reversion of debt. So gamma is less than one over beta minus one. And the monetary authority violates the Taylor principle in the language of Lipper, it means that monetary policy is passive because it passively accommodates the behavior of the fiscal authority. So now you also get a unique solution and the determinants here comes from the fact that inflation is pinned down by the, uh, by the need of keeping debt on a stable path. Essentially, there is a unique path for inflation that makes sure that debt uh, uh, stays on a stable path. And so immediately you can see that in this case, the macroeconomy is not isolated from the fiscal block. Now, even without the distortionary taxation, even without G, the macroeconomy is affected by fiscal imbalances, okay? So now let's see this uh, in, a, in, a, in our simple model, how it works. Suppose that I, remember there's only one shock, okay? Suppose that I have a shock to transfers. So I, may, I, I, I basically give more resources to the household. I have a, a, a primary deficit. Well, if we are in the fiscally led policy mix, you can see that despite the fact that we have non-distortionary non taxation, and despite the fact that we don't have G, we have an increase in inflation. So the reason why is because households are suddenly richer, in a sense they receive uh, resources from the government. And given that there is no commitment from the government of increasing future taxes, this uh, uh, creates a wealth effect that, that leads households to spend more. And the result in this very simple model is inflation, because remember it's an endowment economy, so it has to, the market has to clear and the result is an increase in prices. If instead we are in the, what we call the monetary led policy mix, uh, we get the standard result uh, that Ricardian equivalence applies. There is an increase uh, in, uh, in transfers today, but Asians anticipate that they're going to be taxed more in the future. So what they, what they do with these extra resources that they get from the government, they buy bonds, and then uh, in, the, in the future, they're going to use the uh, revenues from the bonds to pay future taxes, okay? So, so this not, is, oh, sorry, j just to make sure that I get this right now. Um, yeah. So, so it's, it's transfers for you, what would have been government spending for me. And the way the government gives transfers is since it has no resources of its own, it's based on borrowing, right? So on the one yes. hand, I get transfers from the government. On the other hand, I lend to the government. Exactly. Uh, and I kind of feel richer because I have receivables from the government. Yeah. And if the government is going to create surpluses in the future to pay those, I'm yep. in the active monetary policy, right? No inflation. But if it doesn't, then I have to inflate this away. And that's your fiscal world. Exactly. All that's right. exactly correct. Okay. So yes, the, the only thing we, that's perfect. Uh, so once you start thinking about these issues, uh, I, I tend to call, uh, uh, okay, we tend, we tend to call uh, government spending. It's, uh, it, it, we tend to think about transfers and G together, essentially. When we say government spending, we often think about uh, that the government can spend resources or providing transfers to households or, or buying goods from the economy. So, so normally I try to keep these two things distinct and I call transfers when we literally transfer resources to households. And then I call the government purchases that it's a little bit uh, uh, an overkill to denote G. But 
that's that's the reason the reason why I don't want to have G. All the logic that I have over here would go through even if I had G. It just that then it would be hard to see these results so cleanly because G, of course, is going to have an impact on the macroeconomy, even if it is backed by future taxation. Okay. Instead, in this way, if I just make it about lump sum taxes or lump sum transfers, uh, uh, this problem does not arise. It's pure, it's pure zero effect if we are in, the, in what we call the monetary-led policy mix always, and it's pure inflation effect if we are uh, in, in, in the uh, fiscally-led uh, policy mix always. Okay. So this is, a, in a sense, the dichotomy that it, it was at the base of Lipper's result, okay? So if you are in a, in a monetary-led policy mix, uh, uh, the macroeconomy is isolated with respect to fiscal disturbances. If you are in a fiscally-led policy mix, uh, instead the macroeconomy is affected by fiscal imbalances, but through this uh, necess necessity of stabilizing debt. And of course, this goes back, uh, I don't have the related literature slide, I realize that I don't have it, I should probably add it back. Uh, the, this goes back, of course, to the seminal work of uh, Sargent and Wallace that then has been followed by Woodford, Sims, and so on, but we very much build on the work of Eric here. Okay, so this is the background, okay? So the, let's say that this is where the literature was uh, uh, so far, and uh, I've done a lot of work uh, with uh, regime changes, the idea that we can move uh, between uh, these two polar cases that we can sometimes be in a monetary led, sometimes we can be in a fiscally led. And the nice thing about these models with regime changes is that if you are aware of regime changes, there is some contamination across the regimes, okay? So instead in this paper, we're going to play a different game. And I think that it's uh, uh, the reason why we got interested in this idea is uh, uh, because we think it's also a way to uh, easily incorporate uh, the uh, key dynamics, the key results of the fiscal theory of price level in state-of-the-art models. Because models with regime changes are uh, still hard to handle, given that you don't have packages that everybody uh, can easily use. Okay. So what is the idea that we have here? Well, the idea is that instead of thinking about the world is sometimes in a monetary-led policy mix, the world is sometimes in a fiscally-led policy mix, we are going to think that the way policymakers behave change based on the shock that is hitting the economy. So just to give you where we, where we are going uh, with this, if uh, uh, the government uh, uh, is trying to stabilize a pandemic, there might be the, uh, the need of uh, uh, issuing some, some of the unfunded debt, while if uh, you are uh, you know, during regular times, this might not be so much uh, uh, needed. Okay, so what we want to study is a model in which these two policy mix coincide at the same time. And that's what we're going to do next in this very simple model. And then we're going to in incorporate this uh, in a much richer model. Okay, so, so now we're going to introduce this notion of unfunded debt. So we're going to consider the following fiscal rule. So the, the taxes here react to uh, uh, um, debt in deviations from steady state in two different ways, depending if, uh, depending if uh, debt is funded or unfunded. So let me explain how this uh, fiscal rule works. So if, when I look at deviations of debt from the steady state, there is a component with respect to which uh, the government behaves according to the fiscally led policy mix over here. So the idea is that with respect to this component, uh, the government is not particularly forceful in moving taxes. However, the overall amount of debt is not just BF T minus one, where F is here to denote the fact that the fiscally led policy mix applies with respect to this amount of debt. Uh, the government has an additional amount of debt that is essentially the distance between the overall debt and this uh, amount of debt that is unfunded. With respect, with respect to which the government is instead uh, applying a strong fiscal stabilization. And so you can see here the coefficient, we call it gamma M, to denote that with respect to this additional amount of debt, the government is applying uh, a monetary-led policy mix. Okay, so you can think in a nutshell, you can think that there is a, that debt can be imagined as, com as of two components. There is a component that is unfunded, with respect to the government 
with respect to which the government behaves according to a fiscally led policy mix. And there is a component that is funded with respect to which the government behaves according to the monetary led policy mix. Similarly, the monetary authority uh, uh, has a, a, a behavior that is uh, uh, the a mirror image of the behavior of the fiscal authority. So what that means is that uh, when, when you look at overall inflation, there is a component of inflation that uh, arises as uh, uh, the result of unfunded debt. With respect to this component, the, the monetary authority applies a fiscally led policy mix. So what that means is that the Taylor principle is not satisfied. With respect to the remaining component, that is essentially the distance between actual inflation and this uh, uh, um, um, unfunded inflation, the central bank applies the Taylor principle. So what that means is that coefficient phi m is larger than one, okay? So, one, so if you linearize these rules, uh, this becomes, uh, I would say, crystal clear in a, in a way that is very transparent. If you, if you linearize the rules, uh, you can see that there is a component uh, of debt with respect to which the fiscal authority has a, a, a weak response. And then there is a, an additional component of debt for which, uh, with respect to which the, money, the fiscal authority has a strong response according to coefficient gamma. Similarly, the linearized monetary rule says that there is a component of inflation with respect to which the central bank has a weak response. And then there is a comp an additional component of inflation. Think about this as the typical business cycle component of inflation with respect to which the central bank has a strong response. Could I ask, um, is, this any, is this functionally any different from having one kind of um, debt and the response parameter be the weighted average of these two? Does it actually matter that there are two separate kinds of debt uh, or am I good enough saying, uh, well, you know, by saying on 20% of the uh, debt, I'm not going to respond at all. I'm effectively lowering the average response by 20%, and that's the only thing that matters. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, okay, so, yeah, it, it matters for two reasons. First of all, because if you were to write that rule, uh, so these two components of that are not, constant over time. So they are not in a fixed proportion over time, no? So essentially you need to do an accounting exercise that basically tells you at each point in time, what is the fraction, what is the share of the existing debt that is I actually- I agree with this, but I, okay. let, let me push back. Um, yeah. I mean, this seems very similar to a uh, model where the gamma M is effectively a stochastic parameter, right? It changes over time. Um, and that's beautiful, uh, Rafet. Rafet, so I that, that's that's beautiful. It's a very it's a very good comment, and um, and okay, so especially when we look at uh, the um, later part uh, when we look at the empirical analysis, and especially when we think about uh, the Taylor rule response. Uh, so as you, as, you, as you know, there are plenty of papers that show that monetary policy in the seventies was. Uh, uh, violating the Taylor principle, while in, while in the 80s and 90s it was not, no? Yep. Yeah, one possible interpretation of that result uh, is that what really changed is the composition of inflation in these two periods. So it, our, our paper could reinterpret the, the finding of Clarida Galigertre by saying that it's not really that these coefficients change, it's just that the, the composition of inflation changes for which if you estimate a rule that has only one coefficient, you would find that in the 60s and 70s was less than one because there were a lot of these uh, unfunded fiscal shocks, while in the 80s and 90s, it was not. But this, uh, in a sense, I would flip your point and say that I would say it's almost, if you buy our story, of course, is the other way around. That once you go and estimate a model in which uh, 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 the uh, fraction of these sources of inflation or this fraction of uh, these two sources of debt are changing over time and you don't take that into account, you are going to recover a coefficient uh, that is essentially misleading uh, because you are basically taking a weighted average of two different coefficients and depending on the composition of debt or inflation at each point in time, you're going to get different answers. I am, I am very happy to take your interpretation and I wasn't actually pushing back in a, uh, 
uh, structural empirical estimation sense that this might be unidentified. That wasn't the aim. The question is, from a policy perspective, it does. It, want, it, right. It, okay. Let, let no, me it, 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 and see how it does. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, but uh, it's uh, it's all very good, Rifat. So this is uh, these are great points. It does because essentially, as you, as you are going to see in a moment, uh, uh, so the, the way the model is solved essentially, if you if your weighted average is less than one, you get one in, impulse response. If your weighted average is larger than one, you get another impulse response. And so you need to keep track essentially of of these composition effects because otherwise you're going to uh, to get essentially the wrong impulse responses. You are going to get always one kind or the other kind, or even you might get indeterminacy and so on. So it really, for what we are doing in this paper, it is crucial that we keep track of the two components. Okay, but hopefully the next slide is going to clarify why. Okay, uh, before I see that, just for uh, sure. my, I, I don't know, pushing back, yeah. I guess uh, I could do one of two things, right? I could announce a path of, um, BF, right, um, which is a commitment to creating inflation, or I could, this is my question, could I equivalently, from, from a positive perspective, is it feasible for me to commit to a future path of gamma on the total stock of debt that has the same implication? And my hunch is it will be. Right. No, that's that's possible. That is possible that uh, in terms of communication, you could rephrase these as, uh, um, you know, we are going to uh, have this policy response uh, uh, with respect to the overall amount of debt. Yeah. Uh, I think the point uh, here is uh, the the weighted average for any purpose that we are interested in here is a sufficient statistic. And I don't actually care about the individual bits on their own right. That's the point. The distribution, given the weighted average, I don't care how much of this is coming from BM uh, or B, how much of it is coming from BF. At, at, at one particular point in time, it might be true. It might be true in the sense I, I can I need to, I would need to think about this. I, I I think it's possible that you might be able to 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 recover uh, an, an observation equivalent impulse response by fine tuning your gamma. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I dynamically I don't think that's possible because again uh, that would that would require that these two components move in parallel in a way that your desired weighted average is always the same. Okay, but okay. I think I think if you were to make a policy announcement, it, it, you are probably right that you can fine tune the gamma in a way that people need to make a calculation of what is left that needs to be backed yeah. by, by inflation. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Super. Okay. So let me tell you something more. If, uh, if I set uh, the response uh, phi f uh, exactly to zero, remember that the only thing we need is that this phi f is less than one uh, to violate the Taylor principle to have passive monetary policy. But if I further assume that this phi f is equal to zero, then I get something that is interesting. I get a Taylor rule that is essentially isomorphic to a Taylor rule with a time varying target. So essentially, if you, and so here I have a typo, uh, uh, forgive me, this should be phi m, this, this object over here should be phi m. So what you get, you get basically a rule that says that the Taylor principle is satisfied, but the, but the central bank reacts to a time bearing target. Now, the interesting thing is that this is not an exogenous object. Like, so, so sometimes you see papers in which this is, a, in order to fit the data, they need, they need to assume a time bearing target because otherwise they, don't, they cannot really explain why the Fed uh, was tolerating inflation at 10% in the 70s. This is a, has a very precise interpretation in our model. This, uh, this object that in, it, when you look at just the Taylor rule, looks like a time bearing target is uh, the level of inflation that is necessary to cover unfunded debt. So what this is going to lead is what we call a fiscal theory of trend inflation. So you are basically going to get this time bearing component, uh, uh, a low frequency of inflation that is necessary in order to keep that uh, on a stable path. Okay. So not, not, not to be uh, annoying, but I'll, I'll make a similar uh, observational equivalence argument too. And I think this mm -hmm. is important that, uh, but I, I guess pr 
probably because we are uh, monetary economists. We see yes. this as, you know, um, whatever, um, weird, stupid for the 70s in particular, right? Um, unbalanced budgets, whatever, whatever. That is, um, this, you're telling a causal story. There were these budget deficits, and therefore monetary policy had to create that inflation. The flip side, I could equally tell a story where since monetary policy created the inflation for price determinacy, fiscal policy had to create deficits. And therefore, you can have a monetary theory of trend budget deficits. Uh, that, that's an interesting view. And uh, remember that some years ago, I was giving a paper on regime changes uh, at Colombia, and, and Martin Uribe made a similar point. It was, it, I was actually thrown off by that comment back then. So now I'm a bit more prepared. You basically say something like that. You say like, oh, maybe it's uh, it was uh, the uh, the fiscal uh, authority uh, that was uh, in a sense reacting to the behavior of the monetary authority instead of the other way around. I, I mean, in principle, it could be. I think when we think about models of political economy, we tend to think about the other direction of causality. Uh, uh, we think about that uh, you know politicians might have incentives to promise things that they cannot really be funded with taxation, or at least uh, that they're not fully credible in terms of uh, uh, fiscal coverage. I think we, we hear part of these stories even uh, these days, and I think the world uh, is, is full of these kind of stories. We see them in the US, but we see them a little bit everywhere. And also, when it, when we come, when it comes to the history of uh, US uh, in inflation, we're going to argue that the timing seems to be in the other direction. I think the timing seems more that some fiscal decisions were made in the mid 60s and then our inflation unfolded following that. But, but, but in principle, it could be. I mean, in fact, the model here doesn't really take a stance on, uh, uh, on the political economy. It just like uh, you could imagine that in the background, there is a political economy model that gives uh, outcomes, uh, but we don't really have that here. So in principle, it could be simply that the two authorities sit at the table and agree with each other. It could be that the fiscal authority moves first and the monetary authority needs to adjust or the other way around, okay? Okay, so, so now let's go back to our simple model. So now we change the monetary and fiscal rules. We are going to have these fiscal rules. The macro block, I mean, the, the, the rest of the economy is unchanged. So what I can do is to go back to my model and, uh, and basically substitute the, uh, the monetary rule over here and the fiscal rule in the government budget constraint. Now, things look a little bit more complicated now because you, now you have all these moving objects. So now the question is, how, how do you solve this model now that you have this object that you call uh, um, 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 fiscal inflation? Well, the way we do this, uh, we need to essentially characterize the behavior of uh, this in, in inflation uh, of, of fiscal inflation and the behavior of unfunded debt. So how do we do that? Well, what we're going to do, we are going to build a shared economy in which the fiscally led policy mix is always in place and, and only the unfunded spending shocks occur. Okay, what is the purpose of this economy? The purpose of this shared economy is basically to tell you how much inflation you need in order to stabilize that particular amount of debt. Okay, so in, 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 uh, in uh, these macro models, we do this all the time. It's just that normally we, do, we build these shared economies for a different purpose. For example, when we build the natural output, we are building a shared economy in which prices are flexible. So here we do a different thing. We build a shared economy in which only unfunded shocks occur. And that allows us to uh, keep track of how much inflation is necessary to stabilize that amount of debt, okay? And so this, uh, again, goes back to the question that uh, Refet was asking before. Is it important for the model that, uh, you know, you have these two components as opposed to a weighted average? So here you can see that given that different shocks can happen at different points in time, in order to actually solve the model, you need to uh, get it right. You need to uh, essentially know if it was uh, an unfunded shock uh, or, or it was a funded shock. And the way we do this is by basically building this shared economy. So once you do this, then you can go back to, to your impulse responses. And what you find is that if in my more complex model, I have an unfunded fiscal shock, you see that now inflation behaves 
as in the always fiscally led policy mix. So that's why we use the same line here. So if I have an unfunded fiscal shock, the economy behaves as if uh, the, the model is always fiscally led. If instead I have a, a funded fiscal shock, the model behaves as if the, the model is always monetary led. So the key aspect of this model is that instead of uh, thinking that uh, um, two different policy mix prevail at different points in time, we have them coexist with each other. And what is the point of this? Well, the, the, the key feature of, uh, of these policy mixes is that when you are in a fiscally led policy mix, it's not only shocks to spending that change the propagation. Not all shocks change propagation. And so, for example, what you get is that if you have a monetary policy shock and you are in a fiscally led policy mix, uh, if, you, if you increase interest rates, that increases inflation because it has this kind of perverse dynamics for which it increases the fiscal burden. So essentially what we wanted to do in this paper is to have a model in which uh, the, instead of changing the propagation mechanisms for all shocks, uh, we only change the propagation mechanisms for those shocks uh, that arguably uh, were unfunded, for those fiscal shocks that arguably were unfunded or not fully funded, okay? Okay, so now if there are no questions about the logic of uh, how or what I do have a very quick, um, maybe sure, tangential. Yeah. This is this is Butcher speaking, by the way. Um, so does it really matter? I mean, your assumption is that the debt is held short term. So if you know the debt was somewhat long term, yeah, would 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 your results be similar in that sense, or would I would I see something? some sort of a different propagation mechanism because the inflation might have very different implications for the long-term maturities and et cetera. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, a good, that's a good point too. Yeah, okay. So in the richer model, that's why we started from the, the baby model because you know, we wanted to basically show how things work in a, in a, in a, in a baby model. In, in the richer model, we're in fact going to have a maturity structure of that and, and it's uh, uh, in line with the U.S. experience that it, the average maturity structure for the U.S. is around five years in the post-World War II period. Uh, so yes, you are correct that once you have a maturity structure, uh, the, the, the propagation uh, of the shocks changes a little bit. And in particular, what happens is that you need the less uh, of, a, of a spike in inflation and, uh, and, and, and you get a more persistent increase in inflation. So you, given, you essentially get... Uh, um, lower inflation and more propagated over time. And the reason, the reason why is because in, in this case, there are also uh, what we call revaluation effects. So essentially when, uh, when the level of debt increases, sorry, um, forgive me, when the level of inflation increases, uh, this uh, has a revaluation effect on the current value of, uh, of existing debt. And so basically the, there is some stabilization that sim simply comes from the fact that debt gets devaluated uh, uh, as prices of uh, debt uh, drop. However, let me say this, in a, in, a, in, a, in a rich New Keynesian model, like the one we are going to have now, uh, I'm going to present in a moment, this is uh, less relevant that if you were to have, uh, uh, let's say a frictionless economy, like the one I had a moment ago, the reason why is because in the New Keynesian uh, um, model, there are already a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, mechanisms that smooth inflation over time because of carbon pricing, okay, or, or, or Rothenberg, okay. But yes, it, it's all it's all irrelevant. It, I I would say it's not as important as uh, in uh, uh, in frictionless models like the one I just presented you. Because these results, I mean, the the way you explained it seems to be complementing Ricardo Reese's uh, out of his paper where they show uh, since the government debt is held very short term. Inflating away the debt doesn't really help for the fiscal burden of the U.S. because inflation shocks are very, I mean, perceived ones at least are very transitory. Yeah, so I think the problem with the with Ray's paper is that he only takes into account, uh, uh, so he doesn't really have a model. No, so the exercise of Ricardo is uh, uh, I have a jump in inflation by how much debt gets devaluated. No, and uh, is. 
I, I think that paper, I don't know, I, I, I told him, in, I mean, I told him that I think he should discuss this. I think what is missing from that is that inflation has typically other benefits. And, uh, and uh, so here in particular, as uh, 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 what happens uh, in this uh, new Keynesian framework is that you get low real interest rates for a long time and you get the higher output for a long time. So, so that paper only focuses on what is the effect of the jump in inflation. And that is uh, small, but in a sense that we knew also already from the work that Benson did uh, uh, some years ago, uh, it, they do a very nice empirical uh, exercise that Benson of course didn't have, but they, they kind of miss this point uh, that destabilization uh, mostly for, a, for developed economies like the US, destabilization mostly comes from the effects uh, on real interest rates on, and GDP that are going to be very prolonged. No, they're not just like a jump and, uh, and, and that's it. So you're basically lowering the cost of financing debt for a long time and you are increasing real activity for a long time. Okay. Okay, so, uh, uh, but that's a very good, good point. I think like, uh, I, I don't know if Ricardo ever did that. I told him that I think in the conclusions he should, uh, he should acknowledge this because I think otherwise his paper is a bit misleading. Uh, uh, but I don't know if he did, honestly, I don't know. I haven't seen the last version. Okay, so let me, let me present very briefly the model. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the interest of time, I'm just going to give you the key ingredients. Uh, uh, so the model is a, is a state-of-the-art tank model. Uh, so that means that, that we are going to have all the ingredients of the typical New Keynesian framework. We are going to have uh, uh, distortion in taxation, labor and capital income. So sorry, distortion in taxation on labor and capital income. We're going to have uh, hand-to-mouth households. And then like, you were, like we were just discussing, we're also going to have long-term government bonds, okay? And, and then on top of this, uh, we're going to have uh, the typical set of business cycle shocks that are typically used in these models, plus fiscal shocks that instead are often neglected in these models. And finally, we're also going to have a shifter of the uh, Phillips curve. So basically this is like a shock to, that you can interpret this as a shock to long-term inflation expectations in the, in the Phillips curve. Now, the reason why I, I emphasize that we are going to have this large battery of shocks is not because I'm particularly proud of that, but because uh, I want to make sure that somebody doesn't think, oh, there is a, of course you find that these shocks are very important. You never have a, nothing else in the model that can explain inflation or real activities, of course. Okay, so instead I want to make clear that uh, we are playing a fair game here. We are going to allow for all the shocks you can think of and plus these unfunded fiscal shocks. And on top of that, we're also going to allow for this shifter in the new Keynesian Phillips curve as potentially another mechanism that can explain low frequency movements in, the, uh, in inflation, okay? Can I ask why you need the tank model to do this? Why can't okay. this be done in a rank? Yeah, this could be, it, yes, this could be done with rank, yes. Okay. The, it, it, the tank here is not particularly important in itself, except that at some point we want to study the effects of fiscal stimulus. And we're going, and, and so in principle, uh, again, this is a, for fairness, uh, we want to basically argue that fiscal stimulus is particularly powerful only if it's unfunded. And somebody might say, oh, of course, by in a rank model, we know that that's uh, always the case. Uh, you should have a, a, a hand-to-mouth households. For them, uh, uh, transfers are very important because they are hand-to-mouth, okay? So we wanted to have that channel to make sure that we, don't, we were not necessarily killing the importance of transfers in a monetary-led policy mix, okay? So we, we are, when right. we are, I'm going back to this question in a moment. So we're going to have two types of transfers in line with the, the model I presented a moment ago. We're going to have funded transfers with respect to which uh, the monetary led policy mix is in place. And then we're going to have unfunded transfers. So these are transfers that are not backed by future fiscal adjustment with respect to a fiscally led policy mix is in place. Now, the key assumption is that the monetary authority tolerates the increase in inflation that is necessary to stabilize the unfunded debt, okay? So very much in line with the simple model. It's just that here it's a much more complicated. So I think it always helps to see the, the mechanisms in a, in a baby model. So how do the fiscal rules look here? Well, as I was saying, this is a much richer model. So now we have G that we didn't have before. We have Z for transfers. 
we have taxation on labor, taxation on capital. You can see these, uh, uh, the, uh, these coefficients imply that with respect to this uh, level of debt, the, monetary, the fiscal authority behaves according to a monetary-led policy mix. So all these coefficients imply that there is a strong, or strong enough fiscal adjustment to this level of debt. Then we're going to have funded uh, fiscal shocks. So you can see these blue shocks with respect to these shocks that monetary-led policy mix is in place. But then we're going to have these uh, unfunded shocks with respect to which the fiscally-led policy mix is in place. Now, the Taylor rule, similarly to what I had in the simple model, the central bank does not simply react to inflation, but it reacts to inflation in deviations from fiscal inflation, from the level of inflation that is necessary to stabilize unfunded debt. And, and so you can see here why we wanted to have the simple model first, because here we also need to account for the ZLB. So, okay, so that's another layer of complication that we didn't have in the simple model. Okay, so here, just to you know, repeat myself, the funded share of debt is stabilized with fiscal instruments. Uh, the inflation target is uh, the necessary to keep uh, the portion of debt that is not stabilized, stabilized by future fiscal adjustment on a stable track, okay? So this is, again, similar to the simple model that we had before. And the way we solve the model is a very much on, in line with what I explained to you before. We, about, we basically build a shared economy that allows us to keep track of what fraction of debt is funded and what fraction of debt is unfunded. Okay, so here, I'm, I'm going to skip this slide because I'm, I'm running a little bit uh, uh, behind, but it's essentially just an, an explanation in the context of this model of how we build the shared economy. So let me jump directly to the empirical analysis, given that I, have, I think I have half an hour uh, left. So these are the variables that we use. So we use all the typical macro variables, so GDP growth, consumption growth, and so on. Then we have a rich set of fiscal variables. We are going to have the federal funds rate. And then given that we are also analyzing the zero lower bound period, we want to uh, use market expectations about the future federal funds rate. And uh, in, in order to model the ZLB, we are going to use the techniques that have been developed by uh, my co-author Leonardo in some work with the uh, uh, colleagues at the Chicago Fed, in which essentially we, uh, we look at, uh, we model the ZLB as a series of anticipated shocks uh, to the Taylor rule that basically make sure that we never violate the ZLB. Okay, so now let's uh, try, let, before looking at the importance of these unfunded transfer shocks, Let's look at how, in this richer model, an unfunded transfer shock this differs from, from a transfer funded shock. And this goes back to the question or effect why you have end to mouth agents. Let's look at first at the funded transfer shock. That's the black dash line. This has a modest impact on the macroeconomy and, and, and it determines an increase in debt. So the modest increase on the macroeconomy comes from the fact that we have hand-to-mouth households, because if we didn't have hand-to-mouth households and we were in the monetary led policy mix, we literally, we, we, we would have in fact recessionary effects on the economy because the increase in, in lump sum taxes implies that an increase in future, sorry, the, the increase in lump sum transfers implies a future increase in distortionary taxation. Instead, you see that the, 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 there is a little bit of a expansionary impact on, on, on the economy that you see there is an increase in inflation, but it's very modest. And this increase in inflation, given that the monetary led policy mix is in place, is uh, uh, followed by an increase in, in the federal funds rate because the central bank tries to react uh, to inflation. And so you can see that the real interest rate has a small increase. Given that you are increasing the level of spending, the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What happens if instead you have an unfunded transfer shock? Now you get a persistent increase in inflation. Notice that's the blue line. Notice the difference between the two. So massive impact in relative terms on inflation. The central bank accommodates the increase in inflation. So you can see that the real interest rate goes down. Okay, and so this gives you a boom. So going back to the question about Ricardo Reich's work, he doesn't have any of these uh, mechanisms essentially. He doesn't really have this uh, idea that uh, as a result of a shift in the, in the policy mix, uh, you get a prolonged period of uh, low real interest rates. Now, the interesting thing here, and this is important for identification, 
is that an unfunded transfer shock, even if it's increases spending, given that it's generating a boom, and given that it's generating low real interest rates, it determines a decline in the debt to GDP ratio. So here you can see the striking difference with the funded transfer shock. The funded transfer shock has a, it determines an increase in debt and low impact on the macroeconomy. An unfunded transfer shock determines a, a, a drop in real interest rates, and so a drop in the debt to GDP ratio, and it has a large impact on the macroeconomy. Finally, I, I, I told you that we also want to allow for potentially another source of shift in the long-term component of inflation. So we also have this Phillips curve shifter. So this basically like this shock to the Phillips curve. What you can see is that a shock to the Phillips curve also increases inflation. But given that with respect to this shock, the monetary lab policy mix is in place, the real interest rate quickly increases. And as a result of that, debt to GDP ratio increases. Okay, so this is how essentially in the, in the data, we are going to differentiate these three shocks. Okay, so this essentially gives us what we call a fiscal theory trend inflation. It basically gives us movements in inflation that are happen at low frequency. As you can see here, the, the increase in inflation lasts for more than 10, for more than 10 years that, uh, are accommodated by the central bank. And so the way we are going to identify these shocks in the data is by basically looking at how a given shock to transfers affect inflation and uh, debt. Okay, so let, let, let me put things into perspective. So this uh, is uh, the, uh, the series for transfers in the US economy in deviations from steady state. As you can see, I'm, I, I, the red line is uh, uh, like uh, a trend for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for these variables. And we computed this trend over four distinct periods. What a, a first period before the mid 70s, then a period between the mid 70s and 1990, then a period from 1990 up to the uh, COVID, and finally the COVID period over here. So I'm going to talk about these four phases in, uh, in detail next. So as you can see, over the first part of the sample, essentially from the 60s to mid-70s, uh, there is a very large acceleration in uh, the amount of transfers. So you can see that especially starting from the mid-60s, there is a run-up in the amount of transfers. And that is a significant amount, not all of it, but a significant amount of this increase in transfers is coming from unfunded transfers. So how, what, what are these uh, increase, where is, where is this increase coming from? What happens in the mid 60s that explains this? Well, this is when Lyndon Johnson introduces the Great Society initiatives. These were big welfare programs that were supposed to lift people uh, from poverty and create a more uh, uh, equitable uh, uh, society. And uh, you know, they were also a shock to the long-term component of spending, in the sense that given that they were welfare programs, they were established today, but they were going to stay there for a long time. Uh, so as you can see, part, not the entirety, but part of this increase is uh, in, in, the light, in the lens of the model unfunded. Starting from the mid 70s, to 1990, you can see that the overall level of transfers is substantially flat. But when you look at the level of unfunded transfers, you can see that there is a hump shape over here. They keep increasing up to the early 80s, and then they start declining since then. What is the big event here in the early 80s? The Volcker disinflation, okay? So we're going to see in a moment how the model interprets the Volcker disinflation in light of this change in the share of unfunded transfers. Finally, from the, uh, from the, starting from 1990, we have, a, again, a large acceleration in uh, total transfers. And this is uh, mostly funded, but there is still a little bit of an increase in unfunded transfers also over this period. And finally, during the uh, uh, most recent event, the COVID uh, um, uh, recession, we have a first large increase in spending. However, it's hard to see here because, uh, it, it, or because of the scale. However, unfunded transfers didn't increase here. 
but they increase right after. They increase the, the share of unfunded transfers increase in the third quarter of 2020. What is the key event uh, uh, that happens between the second quarter of 2020 and the third quarter of 2020? Well, there is the revision of uh, the statement of long-term goals and, uh, and targets of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve in August uh, of 2020 basically announces a new monetary policy framework that essentially claims uh, that a little bit of inflation above target is uh, tolerable, okay? So as we'll see, this also plays a, an important role in, uh, in, in the way we interpret the data. Excuse okay. me, Before, this is a refit. Before you go on, so in the model, uh, talking about transfers makes sense because you have to talk about some fiscal something in the absence of government spending. But right. in the data, why is it that we are looking at transfers and not any discretionary spending or in fact, non-discretionary spending? You mean like, uh, again, G, like- uh, Yes, uh, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. No, we, we, we also have it in the model. That's a, that's a very good point too. So we have in the model G now. It's not that we don't have it, but given that G in the US economy has been steadily declining, we don't really think that it poses really a, a challenge to fiscal sustainability. We could, uh, we have a version of the model in the appendix in which we model uh, the, uh, the uh, sum of the two components as unfunded. We, we, sh we check what is the share of a G that is also unfunded and results are very similar. Because again, what really seems to be a problem for the US economy is, is not so much the, um, uh, the level of a G, but mostly the level of transfers. Okay, so if you look at G in the US economy it has been basically constantly declining. And so we don't really feel like it's the main source of, uh, fisc uh, of issues for fiscal sustainability. Okay, but there is, the, all the results I talked, I'm, I'm talking about now, they go through, but the lion's share is always going to be from uh, spending for transfers. All right. Okay, so, okay, so I, I basically described the, the behavior of this uh, uh, component over time. Now we want to describe the behavior of the endogenous variables as a result of this component over time. So this uh, 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 red line over here is the series of for inflation in the US economy. The black area is the component of the movements and inflation that are accounted for by unfunded transfer shocks. So the first thing you can notice, if you remember, I told you that starting from the mid sixties, there is an acceleration in unfunded transfers. And so here you can see that the bulk of the run up of inflation in the uh, uh, starting from the mid 60s is accounted for unfunded transfer shocks. And we also had the, the historical narrative that aligns with this uh, uh, econometric analysis. Here, the Great Society initiatives are introduced. Notice that the model does not explain the second run up uh, has unfunded transfers. And I think that's a good thing because this is uh, arguably the second uh, oil shock. Instead, what the model uh, shows is that half of the decline of inflation during the uh, uh, Volcker disinflation is accounted by a revision in uh, the share of unfunded transfers. So what is the interpretation if you want to if you want to think about this as in terms of political economy? So essentially what happened in the early 80s is not just that uh, a Volcker increased interest rates, but there was also a revision in expectations about what fraction of spending was going to be stabilized through inflation. What is the key event on the fiscal side that occurs uh, in, uh, in the early uh, uh, 80s? Well, there is appointment of Reagan over Carter. So Reagan was very much opposed to inflation. Reagan was also very much opposed to the idea that uh, 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 we had of a large government, of a large uh, welfare spending. And so here you can see that the model interprets the decline in inflation as largely as a revision in expectations about what fraction of, uh, of that is going to be stabilized through inflation. Then starting from that period, you can uh -huh. see that- Hang on, so, sure. so here, here's a benefit of having the tank model where you could actually see these transfers as properly transfers to the lower income people Right, right now that you have a distribution and ask the welfare question, right? You know, are these people actually better off given that lower inflation actually comes with lower transfers? Yeah. Right? Because now suddenly you have a distributional impact of lower inflation, which has to come with uh, appropriate fiscal policy too. 
Yeah, I, I, I like that comment a lot. Yes, I, I think that that's something we could do. We haven't done it uh, here because we felt like we already had a lot, but, but that's a very good point. Yes, we could definitely dig a bit more into uh, uh, you, what, what, this is what, what were the welfare implications of having this large spending, but at the same time with larger inflation, given that arguably the cost of inflation are not uh, equal across different uh, groups. So yeah, that, that's something we can do. Um, and uh, we actually thought about doing that also in, an, in another paper uh, in which we basically argue uh, that, you know, in the euro area, a reform of the fiscal framework would be necessary to get out uh, of, the, uh, of the low interest rate environment. So we can do that, yes. Okay, so then uh, uh, the, starting from the early 80s, essentially after the Volcker disinflation, you can see that the, there is still a, quite a bit of uh, fiscal inflation so the reason why we haven't seen high inflation is essentially because there are other forces, arguably globalization or changes in demographics, that push inflation in the opposite direction. So you basically have some deflationary pressure that, they, that this large uh, amount of uh, unbacked fiscal spending is counteracting. And finally, you can see that if you look at the very end of the sample, you can see that there is a big spike in fiscal trend inflation, okay? So you can see here, we'll get back to that when we focus on the, uh, on the COVID uh, recession. So I have a kind of a, you know, expositional maybe question. Sure. So your, your whole story is about the inflation trend. So right. one thing that I would like to see might be is what the inflation expectations are doing when this is happening. Because since 1990 and you know, until 2019, I guess, I haven't looked at the latest numbers. The inflation expectations, at least in the SPF 10 years ahead, was stuck at two and a half. And starting from 1990s, it started going down. Right. So, right. So what, what, what one thing maybe you could say is these two shocks are contracting each other, which doesn't really have any much effect on the inflation expectations, which could be a measure for trend inflation of some sort. Right. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yes, we could, uh, we could also look at uh, implications for, for inflation expectations. So, yeah, and, and the... But and the answer, yes, it, it is uh, that uh, arguably you're going to have this counteracting effect in the same way, given that inflation is not uh, too high, uh, the, the model would probably account for the idea that, okay, so yes, there is some inflationary pressure coming from the fiscal side, but there is deflationary pressure coming from uh, uh, the, what we call non-policy shock side. And, and the two effects are kind of can, a little bit canceling each other when it comes to inflation expectations. But yeah, we could definitely look into that. Uh, when, we, when it comes to GDP growth, remember, this again, going back to the question on Ricardo's work, uh, so this is where things start differing because here inflation is not just, oh, I devaluate debt. That's not the whole point of inflation. Instead, what you get is that you, you get effects on real activity. So you can see that in the, the acceleration in uh, inflation in the, in, starting from the mid-60s, it actually has a beneficial effect on real activity. So you have higher than otherwise growth coming from, um, from these uh, uh, unfunded transfers. Of course, you have the oil shocks that push in the opposite direction, but these uh, unfunded transfers lift the economy. And symmetrically, when you cut them, when you have the Volcker disinflation, the fact that uh, all of a sudden there is a revision that these unfunded transfers basically become funded, you have a negative effect on the real economy. And finally, let me, let me uh, jump uh, directly to the uh, COVID uh, period. You can see here, this uh, bar, uh, I mean, I don't know if you can see it, <laughs> but basically there is a, here a vertical bar that accounts for half of the recovery in, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, as a result of unfunded transfer shocks. Okay, so large boost to real activity at the end of December. Okay, so now let me zoom in this event. You know? Let me zoom in on the COVID recession because in a sense that this was how we started. We basically started with this idea, are we at risk of a return to the 70s, of a run up in inflation? Well, let's look at how the model interprets the COVID period. So what, the, what I have here is uh, two forecasts, uh, two projections. One is what we call the baseline. So it's the basically the forecast based on filtered data up to the fourth quarter of 2020. So essentially that's where we stop, okay? That's the end of our sample. We take the data as uh, they were in 2020 quarter four, we take uh, our uh, parameter estimates and we project 
the economy into the future. Uh, we also consider a counterfactual scenario, so a counterfactual forecast that is instead says, uh, suppose that I take my estimates and suppose I take the state of the economy as interpreted by the model, and I say that all shocks are funded now. So suppose that I make all the unfunded uh, transfers, I make them funded. What would happen? Okay, so what you can see is that the, our baseline scenario is one in which the economy actually has a pretty robust recovery. And also our baseline scenario is one in which inflation goes above target. See, it goes up to 4%. Instead, uh, if you were to all of a sudden claim that all that is fully funded, this would have a dramatic impact on the economy. It would have a, a deflationary effects. So you see that inflation would be uh, in the negative territory, very weak recovery. So essentially what is happening here is that uh, there, is a, uh, uh, there are low real interest rates because there is a significant fraction of debt that is unfunded. In the moment you, you make everything funded, these uh, beneficial effects that disappear, you are at the zero lower bound. And so what happens is that you get higher real interest rates. So what is the lesson that we get from, from this exercise? First, uh, that the, the fact that uh, we have a fraction of unfunded debt uh, is actually beneficial in this uh, uh, situation because monetary policy is constrained by the zero lower bound and this unfunded debt creates some inflationary pressure, the lower real interest rates and uh, increases ours. The second lesson that we get is that, yes, there is an increase in inflation, but it's not overly dramatic. So it's like a, a 4% maximum, okay? Now, let me go one step farther and let me consider the effects of the ARPA shock. Remember that the ARPA shock was uh, implemented in the first quarter of 2021. So this is after our estimates. So let me tell you what we do then to analyze the ARPA shock. We take our estimates up to 2020 quarter four, and then we, based on our parameter estimates, we attribute a fraction of the ARPA shock to unfunded fiscal transfers based on the historical evidence. So let me explain what that means. Suppose that typically every time there is an increase in transfers, 10% is unfunded and 90% is funded. Then we apply the same logic to the ARPA shock, okay? Technically, it's a bit more complicated than that, but essentially, in a nutshell, that's pretty accurate. Once we have, a, 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 once we have the ARPA shock, we divide it into unfunded and funded. What, what we do, we say, let me take the economy as it was in 2020 quarter four, and let me just uh, hit it with these shocks uh, in the first quarter of 2021. But other than that, we don't use macro data for this period. We only use the ARPA shock itself. And then we basically check how the model behaves. Remember, the blue line is, again, my baseline, the same one I had before. So the projection based on data up to 2020 quarter four. The red line is adding this ARPA shock. ARPA shock sorry. So now to our uh, um, pleasant surprise, uh, when you add this ARPA shock, we get a projection for inflation that is almost... Uh, exactly in line with what we saw. So why is this relevant in the current policy debate? Because it's basically suggesting that there is a component of the increase in inflation that we have experienced now that is actually the result of this fiscal shock. Okay, there's a lot of- says, Sorry, but so it, so it also, you know, um, I guess we should have you back for a very short chat, uh, you know, in the first quarter of 2022, because it also says, Inflation should have peaked now, right? Um, that beginning next quarter, we should be seeing declining inflation. Yeah. So the model here, the, so, so of course, uh, Powell uh, just said, oh, you know, people have different uh, questions, uh, uh, different ideas of what transitory means or not. Uh, so the, what the model is saying here is that the notion of transitory is uh, like one year, essentially. Okay. So I think uh, the, the model predicts uh, elevated inflation for uh, quite a bit. Uh, then again, it depends what, what, what people mean with transitory. So uh, if, if people meant a month or a quarter, yeah, they, again, they got disappointed, okay? 
but yes, so you can, so here the model predicts that as a result of this uh, robust fiscal intervention, you are going to get even more inflation. But now the, the positive side of all of this uh, is that this allows you to start lifting a little bit earlier. So notice that here we are, we, uh, uh, we are leaving the ZLB a little bit earlier and it lowers real interest rates significantly. And again, it sustains the recovery. So the, the, the two lessons here is that the, this fiscal stimulus was actually powerful in uh, uh, stimulating the recovery, not because of the uh, hand-to-mouth agents. So that goes back to the first question, why do you have them? Well, it's powerful because of the particular policy mix that is applied to a, to a portion of these uh, uh, ARPA fiscal stimulus. May, may and I yeah, so let me just want ask, uh, add one thing because then I'm done. And the second thing we learned is that we are not really at the moment a risk of a return to the 70s. So here it's, a, it's, a, it's an increase in inflation, robust, but still 5% uh, uh, maximum. Okay, so please. I, I waited until the very last moment to ask this. Um, so maybe I missed, <coughs> missed it when you probably already said it already. Um, so things like infrastructure projects. Should you think of them as funded or unfunded? Yeah, so uh, uh, infrastructure projects, uh, based on the discussion so far, they want to fund them. They basically try, that's what they're arguing about, uh, uh, you know, that how we fund these things. Uh, so, but that also shows you the, why this idea of thinking about what is funded and unfunded is so important. And again, I'm very happy to apply this to G2. As I was saying, and we focus on transfers because in the, in the great scheme of things, uh, transfers are the lion's share of government spending and are the ones that are not going away because the population is going to age and they are uh, constantly increasing and so on. But in principle, we can also apply the same logic on uh, when we have an increase in G, is this fully funded or not? I mean, it, you would get similar mechanisms there uh, I told you, empirically, we didn't find a big difference when we were allowing for G to be part of this unfunded uh, uh, component of debt. And the reason why, again, I wanna, I wanna emphasize this, the reason why we didn't find a big effect is because G historically has been moving down significantly as a fraction of GDP. Now, it is possible that, but I find that likely, if you, if you hear the discussion, even in the current policy debate, it's all about uh, free college for everybody, uh, um, healthcare for everybody, uh, daycare for everybody. And, and, and by the way, I, 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 I'm not talking about politics here, okay? I, I'm not even going to tell you what my preferences are. I, I have two kids, so you can imagine that uh, I'm not necessarily <laughs> opposed to everything. The key point for the discussion here is that you can be uh, a social democratic country. There is nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, it just then you need to clarify how you're going to sustain this spending, okay? So there are many countries that have very generous uh, level of spending and, and they need to increase taxes as a result of that. Actually, I was going to, uh, sorry, I was just, just let me finish. I was just going to, going to actually uh, follow up on that because I remember talking to Valerie Ramey. Yes. And I asked her a um, question along the line of, okay, should I think of infrastructure projects as funded or unfunded? I probably in your language, this is the right question. So, and then if I remember correctly, she said, you know, infrastructure projects tend to pay for themselves. Yeah, I don't know. This sounds a little bit like... Uh, like I when mean, you build a road, okay. something like that. You know, yeah, it tends to pay for yeah. Itself, so, so, yes. Okay, so that, that's important too, okay? So, uh, um, you know, if you build a road or you build a tunnel mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. charge people uh, to... to to use the tunnel, then it's a different story, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I think here it's, it, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily that every time you have, uh, you write down a bill, you need immediately need to say what is the taxes that are going to increase. So as long as uh, in expectation, the, the project is going to be covered mm -hmm. by future revenues of some sort, then it's fine. And it's possible you know, that a bridge, a tunnel for which you charge, or, or the increased real activity in the economy. And then because of tax revenues, uh, it co they cover the cost, uh, it might be uh, co paid by itself. And so that's why, again, that might be part of the reason why empirically, going back to what I was saying before, empirically, even when we allow for G to be there, we don't find that, that shocks to G 
play a big role in this uh, story of unfunded versus funded. So them, in other words, they, they seem to, to, to be almost irrelevant for our story. And would be irrelevant for the reason that maybe um, due to classification issues, the effects just wash out, right? I think it's not irrelevant, but they just, it's difficult to estimate because it's difficult to say which component is what. Right now, yeah, here, here, cons consider this. We observe uh, movements in transfers and we observe movement in G. So, the way the model works uh, the, is that he attributes uh, these uh, shifts uh, to one or the other based on what it seems to happen to inflation, what, based on what it seems to happen to real interest rates, based on what happens to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to real activity. So, it's through the lens of the model that you attribute. Uh, 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 transfers or G to funded and unfunded. So in the sense, it's an identification assumption. No? So Remy, Valerie works a lot with VRs. She does identification assumptions into a VR setting. A DSG model, in a sense, uh, it's already, the identification assumption is already built in. You might like it or not, but you know, it, it is there. The, that's the entire point of writing down the model because otherwise, you know, we are just wasting our time, okay? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I, I like the model and everything. I was just asking these questions because... No, no, I'm, um, not, I'm not upset. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, following up on your question. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you, it. thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I do like the model. I just wanted to hear what yeah. you think. Thank you. So could I, uh, could I push you, uh, and seriously, in uh, studying the distributional implications of this, in the sense that... Uh, and you're not saying this, but uh, since you know you and others studying these things don't say it out loud, it it creates this weird impression that you know either when you're spending, either you have to tax for this, and the public will have to pay, or you're going to create inflation. Period. But the implication seems like, and the public doesn't have to pay. But of course. Public has to pay at all times. Oh I, no, yeah, no, okay. No, 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 okay. I, 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 I hope I hope I didn't no. I hope I didn't give that impression. So I think maybe sometimes hang I on. Call, hang yeah. on, hang on. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. You know, you're not saying this, but oh, you're okay, not sorry. saying the you are not saying the reverse clearly either. And I think that needs to be said. Either way, the public is paying, and as Absolutely. either way the public is paying, actually, right? Um, from, from a resource transfer perspective, it doesn't matter whether I pay by taxes or whether I get taxed under the name of inflation, okay? Uh, it only matters if I care about the inflation independently, which I do, but it's not very clear why I do in some of these models, right? right? Okay, now, in it, but the beauty of the tank model is the people who care about the transfers, the people who care about the taxes and the people who care about the inflation are different people. And That's there very good. you yeah. actually properly study right? Um, I could tax this, right? And depending on my taxation schedule, it's these people who are affected. I could inflate this away. And if I'm giving transfers to the poorer people, and I am taxing and, and, and uh, inflation is a wealth tax that is taxing the richer people, right? right? I also engineer a income distribution, which I may like based on my distributional preferences. Right. Or I could say poorer people have to work with nominal assets. Richer people have access to inflation protection. Right. right? Um, and, and, and make it clear that those assumptions and that access to financial products and things of that sort are what really drives the welfare consequences here. Right? Because, yeah. again, we're almost hardwired to say, except now, but in general, Right, you know, policies that don't lead to inflation are better policies because inflation is a bad thing, right? Um, but you know, perhaps there is a political economy of this, uh, and and in fact, perhaps there is a positive economy of this where we say, well, you know, inflation is perhaps not that bad because, um, you know, in in a sense, we are kind of used to now thinking of, well, if you wanted to lower real wages, inflation is a good way of doing this, right? Otherwise, workers scream too much. You know, perhaps if you wanted to tax wealth, inflation is a good way of doing this. Otherwise, the one percent screams too much. And right. you actually have built the machinery to ask exactly these questions. So I'm right. asking you to use it. Yeah. Uh, now these are excellent points. So let me 
I, I, I agree with you. And I, I think that's uh, uh, something that can be done already in this model. Probably to, to address some of the comments you made, uh, you would need an even richer model because here yeah, we don't have really have a, a rich uh, idea of uh, uh, you know, wealthy people are uh, protect, more likely to be protected against inflation. But I, I mean, there is, there is absolute truth in what you say. Let me, let me say what I, I can say with respect to that in the context of, uh, of this paper. And in, in particular, I want to emphasize something important that sometimes gets a bit missed. So there is a difference, in a sense, between the 60s and 70s. So the, the, say, the, the fact that you generated some inflation in the 60s and 70s and the inflation that we are seeing today. So here, there is a first order effect that is going to benefit everybody, uh, wealthy or not wealthy. That is the fact that you put, uh, uh, you find a remedy to the zero lower bound. So here you generate an increase in inflation and, an in, and a drop in real interest rates in a moment in which monetary policy is constrained. Given that this sustained the recovery, uh, the distributional effects are second order with respect to the fact that you are pushing, out the, pushing the economy out of a recession. Having said that, it's absolutely true that you could look at the whole period without kind of zooming in just on the current situation. You could look at the whole period and basically analyze more in detail what are the welfare consequences of different policy interventions, even that in a sense are meant to help certain fractions of the population, certain areas of the population, in the moment that you generate inflation with them. So I think that those are all excellent comments. And uh, I almost think that you would need to kind of write a paper just on that, uh, because it sounds like it's not the easiest uh, uh, thing in the moment you want to take seriously, you know, the fact that some, some groups might, be, might have a different participation. Well, I, I, I completely agree. I'm just saying you are the right person to write that paper. Yeah. No, no, I, I, no I, I, I agree with you, Refet. I think that's, that's a great suggestion. I think that, I mean, we might do it. <laughs> so I'm just saying, I don't know. I don't think, I'm not sure we can do it in this paper. I think what we could do in this paper is to first highlight this point I made that at the current, in the current recession, everybody benefits. And we could show that formally in the sense we could plot the, the consumption of the different groups. So let me conclude basically, okay? And because I'm basically done, I think we already discussed the, most of the things. So what, 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 what is the idea here? So we are facing unprecedented challenges. We have high debt that will require fiscal corrections. At the same time, we are facing a deflationary bias, monetary policies constrained by the zero lower bound. So in this situation, coordinated policy uh, between the monetary and the fiscal authorities are very useful. That's exactly the question that we, the, the, the point we were making right now, because they allow with a modest increase in inflation in exiting the zero lower bound, uh, lowering the, uh, the necessity to uh, increase the distortion in tax taxation. And the key point that we want to make uh, is this idea that you use a coordinated strategy is very much in line with historical experience. So in other words, uh, the data suggests that there is a, a, a constantly a fraction of debt that is stabilized through inflation. What is the caveat over, overall? That on the other hand, historically, this fraction of debt has been moving very slowly. So now you have a, a massive amount of debt. So what that means is that if, if agents were to have even a small revision in their beliefs about what fraction of this debt is in fact fiscally sustainable, you could really have a spar of inflation. And so that's why monetary, uh, monetary fiscal policy coordination is particularly important here. And that's also why monetary policy communication is important here. Let me explain why. So monetary policy is much better at communicating to the public uh, uh, the uh, expected path for the, for the variable of interest. So it's essentially the monetary authority by setting up a, a clear path for the future, uh, for future inflation, what is tolerable and what is not tolerable, essentially will help to coordinate beliefs also about what fraction of that is fiscally sustainable. In the moment you don't have clear communication on this, then you, you, you start having panics about are we moving back to the 60s uh, and 70s and so on. Okay, so I'm done. Thanks a lot for all the great comments uh, and I can maybe restore your faces now. <laughs> For you, the last few seconds. you cannot share the thing altogether. Um, okay, um, hang on.
Okay, that's better. Excellent. Well, I can I can ask a quick quick question quick question about the uh, from the perspective of an optimal policy. Uh, do the rule uh, do the um, rules that you show? Can you tell them? Can you tell that they're welfare maximizing or? Uh, it's a very, do it's your very paper good. take a stand on that? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, uh, and it's related uh, also to uh, what Refet was asking before. So, uh, um, so I, what in another paper with, that I have with uh, still Leonardo and Anna Rogantini, we show that formally we show that at the zero lower bound, once you encounter the zero lower bound, this mechanism is well for improving. So it reduces the volatility of inflation and it reduces the volatility of output because essentially you put uh, you you avoid the ZLB or you reduce the consequences of the ZLB. Uh, outside that the the zero lower bound period, typically a monetary led policy mix uh, is uh, uh, superior if you don't have distortion in taxation. Once you have distortion in taxation, then a little bit of inflation as a, as a, a, a stabilization mechanism is desirable too. Okay, so then Lipper, I don't know what Eric is going to present next week, but he has a nice paper in JME. I, I was the associate editor for that paper, so I, I know it very well. In which it shows that in models, in new Keynesian models, in which you have a maturity structure, so goes, this goes back to the idea that the maturity structure allows you to smooth the cost on inflation over a prolonged period of time, as opposed to have big spikes in inflation, it is optimal to actually use a bit of inflation uh, to stabilize that. And I, I thought that was a very nice uh, uh, result. Uh, and again, is because you have distortion in taxation. If you didn't have distortion in taxation, then uh, it would be clear cut. If you don't have distortion in taxation, the monetary lab policy mix is always uh, more stable than the fiscal lab policy mix. This is something that- But, but when you're at ZLB, what does monetary lab policy actually mean? Because you know, that's, interest that's rates. That the only way to stabilize the economy is uh, then the, you know, fiscal policy side. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. That that's absolutely correct. Yes. That's that's why the zero lower bound uh, uh, changes these uh, these ideas. So with the zero lower bound, even if you have uh, non distortion in taxation, given that essentially monetary policy becomes uh, unable to do anything. The only way you can get out of there is the, using uh, uh, this fiscal led policy mix. This is an idea that uh, uh, goes back also to uh, Woodford uh, in, a, in, a, in a much more stylized setting. It was showing that you can make the zero lower, <coughs> sorry, you can make the zero lower bound fiscally unsustainable. So here we are basically formalizing these in a, in a new Keynesian setting and so on. But they, they, in a nutshell, he already had that, uh, that idea in his, uh, uh, is in, in his book in, uh, in, in Interested Prices. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm considering Griffith to just earlier question about the government spending. You know, there are some papers having this government spending, uh, which is in the form of a public spending which might also enter the utility function. So again, from the perspective of an optimal policy, fiscal policy might also want to stabilize the movements in the government spending as well. That might also be relevant maybe in your setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, a, that, that's good too. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's fair mm -hmm. enough. Uh, you know, if you provide the services mm -hmm. to the public that are useful and the people value, uh, without mm -hmm. any question that there are welfare improvements uh, uh, in, uh, in, in using them. Uh, that is as more like uh, uh, to do with the benefits of spending. As I was more focusing on uh, given a level of spending, how you cover it. But yeah, that's, yeah mm -hmm. that, that's, that's right, yes. And if I may, just a very quick question about the estimation part. You know, I don't know whether what the literature stands about the including the uh, COVID periods, because now that I see that there is this huge difference between your blue line and that's, you know, the one with an additional shock. What would your model tell if we just exclude the COVID period? If you just, you know, do the estimation up to 2019 Q4, because that might, you know, I, I don't know how you deal with that uh, COVID, shock, COVID shock thing, but... Uh, I saw some papers having, or let's say, treating the COVID period as just an outlier, and uh, uh, yeah. you know, 
it, it would be nice to see uh, the projections excluding the COVID period on that on those graphs. Yeah, let me. Yes, let me. Mm. I write it down. Yeah, we haven't tried that. Uh, mm -hmm. do the estimate excluding COVID period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, so this was, I think, excellent in that the topic was great. The speaker is doubly great. And it's uh, such a clear presentation that, you know, um, it's not always that one follows a presentation from beginning to end and is able to be engaged. Uh, so, you know, you kept us on our toes and made us be engaged. So I'm very <laughs> grateful. Um, it's great to see you. It's, this is not a substitute for an actual visit. So we'll make that happen when we are traveling properly again. But thank you. No, thank you to all. And uh, thanks all, for all the great questions. It was, it was fun. And uh, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to coming in person at some point. We'll make that happen. Good. Okay. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you. Bye-bye.